hope you like the session. You learn something new, or at least at least find it entertaining. I'm trying to locate the chat here in this uh, interface. Let me try to find it. There we go. So I'm gonna try to to monitor the, the chat a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if I can keep up with with that and and the talk at the same time. But anyway, so. Uh, we're going to talk about R2DBC, JDBC, reactive programming. We are going to make a comparison also between the two, and we are going to, um, uh, well, try to figure out if it's worth it to move from JDBC to R2DBC. So before we start, just a few words about myself. So I'm a software engineer with, I don't know how many years of experience, but I've been coding since I was... 13 years old, and I, now I'm a bit more than 40, so it's been a while. I have, uh, I'm have i the author of these three three books on Vadin, which is a uh, web framework um, that allows you to create web I, user interfaces um, using the Java language. Well, I'm getting some... Ah, some I'm sure it's not. Uh, from somewhere. Okay, so it's working now. And uh, I work in developer relations um, for MariaDB. And it's important to notice a couple of things here. So uh, there is something called, let me get back here, uh, Maria, the MariaDB Foundation, which uh, makes sure that the uh, MariaDB community server continues to evolve, continues to be adopted. And then there is not just one single entity controlling the source code, just kind of to avoid what happened to um, MySQL. And there's the MariaDB Corporation, which is the uh, one of the contributors uh, to the uh, MariaDB community server, which is uh, uh, published under the uh, GPL license, um, it actually employs most of the the, the guys who are uh, implementing the community server. Mm, but it also creates a bunch of cool technologies. Uh, by the way, one of those is, for example, the connectors, the the Java connector and uh, um, the Node.js connector, uh, Python connector, uh, C++ connector. Uh, and, and, and there are more things. So for example, the MariaDB Enterprise Server, which is what you should use if you are using MariaDB and go to uh, production. It's a hardened version of the community server, more secure, uh, better, better uh, defaults and, and more functionality. Uh, MariaDB Maxiscale, which is a database, the database proxy, but it's an intelligent proxy. So it knows the difference between a read and a write. So it understands SQL, which is pretty cool. So your application sees just one, uh, node, one database, but it could be many and there could be all kinds of rules there um, directing the, the reads and writes or any kind of logic um, to these nodes there. Pretty cool technology, MariaDB max scale. There's MariaDB column store. So MariaDB has a unique approach to databases. So it can handle multiple workloads, pretty much any workload actually, uh, through multiple or different um, Mm, storage engines. So one of those is Column Store, which allows you to run analytical queries. Analytical is in the sense of maybe you are running, uh, uh, you know, a um, sum of all the values in a uh, uh, in a column or an average or a combination of things. There, right? Uh, these kind of queries are super fast with Column Store without having to configure any indexes. So yeah, it will. It will be fast if you configure some indexes, but you know the pain that it is to configure indexes. Um, so if you're kind of uh, struggling a bit with that, check column store. MariaDB expand is super cool because this enables something called distributed SQL. And this is kind of an automated charting, let's put it that way. So you're, again, your application doesn't know that there is that there are uh, slices of data uh, divided in all these nodes and that you can scale uh, pretty much without limits and you can scale their rights. So it's pretty cool because I don't know if somebody has told you that uh, relational databases don't scale. If somebody tells you that, show them distributed SQL and ready to be expand as an example of a distributed uh, SQL database. There are others. Um, they scale pretty much like uh, no limits. And there is MariaDB Sky SQL that you can you can uh, use um, to create MySQL. Uh, sorry, uh, MariaDB services, and you can try it out MariaDB.com/slash Sky SQL for free. Uh, no need to introduce and create car or anything like that. Uh, I invite you to to try it out. Anyway, so we're going to 
we're going to talk about RTGBC and, uh, and Project Reactor. I have the logos here. And so the idea is that we are going to implement a blocking service with JDBC. Then we're going to implement a non-blocking service with RTGBC. And then we're going to compare the comparison. So it's these three parts kind of to structure this talk. So uh, let's just jump into the uh, ID. Let me try to find it here. So I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code. I wonder if I can uh, hide this thing. Let me see. All right, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I have these two projects, right? So blocking service, let's start with that. Let me show you the bomb.xml first of all. I just created this with the Spring Initializer. Uh, I'm having, uh, I added data JPA, right? JPA web, which is based on servlet. Spring security, although we are, I'm going to disable Spring security. I'm not going to use it, but I need a class from there just for this example. It's going to be clear later. Dev tools in case we need to restart. And since we are using JPA, then we need a JDBC driver. So I'm using the MariaDB uh, JDBC driver, Lombok to save some typing. And um, the rest is just, it's not that, that interesting for this presentation. It was as generated by the, uh, the um, initializer. Okay, so let me show you also this file here is application the properties. So um, I have configured this already. So port 8080, uh, just want to be explicit here. That's the default, but because we're going to have two services. So 8080 there, and I'm excluding from the auto configuration uh, spring security, right? So I'm not actually using that. And here's just a connection. And you can see there's an IP address there. That is because we're going to use, actually, let me show you that. I believe uh, that we need is a node 02. Let me try. I hope it works. If not, we'll create uh, one more connection. Let me check that the, these servers are on. Close connection. There we go. So <laughs> what's happening here is that I have this uh, cluster, right? So it's, these are just two Raspberry Pis connected to a power supply. And they are connected to my local network through Wi-Fi. So I'm connecting here to, to one of those nodes. They have replication and everything. Um, I, I created a video on the MariaDB uh, YouTube channel where I explain how to set up that. Mm, it's pretty nice. So anyway, so there's replication be between uh, these two nodes. And we're going to use this uh, database, which contains words. So I, I created this uh, uh, example application. It's a, it's a clone of uh, the very famous game called Wordle, right? So I created a clone and I tried to uh, implement the, the um, game logic using SQL. Of course, you wouldn't do that in production ever, mm, but I just wanted to figure out, is it possible? And, and it is, it's pretty cool. Uh, you can find a blog about it in the MariaDB uh, website. Anyway, so we're gonna use that database that has some hundred, hundreds of thousands of words there. We're interested in the ID and the text. We're not interested in all that. Uh, so that's it. That's what, what we're going to do. Let me get back to then two. Uh, we can close this one. And on the Java side, I have just the uh, Spring Boot application with the fully static void main method. So I didn't do anything there. Let's code something here. Let's first create a word, the Java class. There's going to be a JPA entity. And I'm using Lombok, so let's use data here to create all the getters, setters, and all that for us. Uh, we need an, an ID, and because this is an ID, then we probably need to mark this with uh, ID from, come on, show me the autocomplete thing, uh, from Java X persistence, which is uh, the DBC. Then we need a string with the text, and then we are going to need something more, which is, let's call this computed data. and we don't want to persist that, so I'm going to say transient here from job persistence. That's it. We have the entity. Let's create now a word repository. And this is going to be an interface that stands uh, JPA repository or repository if you want to get all the, um, you know, all the default methods there. 
public, I don't need to say public, it is an in interface. Let's create a method that returns a list of words. And let's call these uh, find uh, random words. And we want to tell it how many, how many uh, words we want, to, we want to get from the database. And let's create the query here. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to use a native query. Native query, true. Because I want to make a kind of as, uh, a fair comparison, or at least as fair as possible with r 2 uh, And let's create the query. So for that, maybe we can open a new, um, is it this one? Yeah, a new um, document here to, to test the, the query. So I'll select. We need, as I said before, ID and text from Word. And here's a trick. So if we want to get random words, we can order by rand and then limit to how many. So let's say we want three in this example. There we go. So three, three words. And uh, you can see it kind of takes a little bit of time. That's uh, because I'm using these very tiny computers here. <laughs> so, and they are not optimized or anything. On the contrary, uh, they are going through through Wi-Fi and there's a bunch of things going on there. Uh, so that it kind of simulates uh, that scenario. Okay, so it takes a little bit of time to get that um, this query ready. Uh, I didn't copy the, the the query. Let's let's copy that. Just this, and we need it here. Also, let me maybe um, format this a little bit. Here we go. So uh, limit. Let's use this parameter over here, which I I see. I have a typo. There we go. Um, so it's gonna use this this value in the query. I think the repository is ready. Let's continue with the, actually, let me check something here. It's a repository of what? Word and words have long IDs. So I hope that was the thing. Mm, yeah, there we go. Now uh, let's create a word service now just to um, expose that repository a little bit. Mm, so let's create a private final word repository. We need a reference to that repository. And since we are using um, Lombok, we can say required card arts constructor. So this basically uh, creates this constructor here that accepts a word repository, right? Now there's going to be a service, a REST service, so a REST controller, and we need uh, request mapping to kind of uh, configure the endpoint. Now, if it was a, a natural application, real-world application, you would do something like API and then version one, two, three, or whatever. This is an example application, that's, uh, that's fine. And let's create a public list, not that list. Let's import this one of words find random words and limit. And we're going to return the repository dot find random words with the same limit here, right? So this is a common use case. Sometimes you just want to return data as it is from the SQL query, but sometimes you need to process that. So let's simulate that by creating a, a method that returns a word that takes a word and returns a word. So let's say feel data. I'm gonna do it this way so it's very easy to use later. Mm. And we're going to return the exactly the same object here, but we are going to create a new by B script, uh, where is it? Script password encoder dot encode. And we're going to encode get text. Why that? So because this takes time to encode. So it's the processor actually working. And I like that. I want to simulate that instead of doing red dot sleep, it feels like it's not real <laughs> for some reason. So I'm gonna do it that way. Word that set computed data encoded. Oh encoded. So we have that method. And now what we can do is just play with streams. So we can create a stream here uh, and then map the using, uh, map each word using the fill uh, data method. And of course we need to convert this to list back to, to list from stream to list. So we return it. 
that's it. So we need to map also this um, uh, method to an endpoint. Let's use request mapping or get mapping. We could use that as well, the get method, HTTP method. And let's say uh, this is going to be um, words, just like that, words. Mm, I guess that's it. So we should have now a functional service or microservice if you want. Let's start that. This is the blocking service. Blocking because it's uh, using uh, um, J JDBC, all right? Okay, so it seems like uh, this thing's working. We clear this, but let's let's try that in a browser. So I'm going to bring this browser over here. Localhost 8080 works. Uh, works. Come on. Limit is going to be uh, one word. Let's see if it works with one word. Here we go again. Yeah. Now, notice what happens if I if I request 100 words, and I want you to see to look over here at the bottom of the, the screen, and I'm going to hit enter, and you're going to see that the that no, sorry, not in this one, but you're going to see that everything everything is ready, right? So I'm going to press enter and end multiple times here. Is it? It takes time because that's what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to simulate this work there and also database, but did you see that? So it's all data came and that's it, right? That's it. So once the 100 words are ready, you get them in the browser. So you have to wait that time. Okay, that's what we wanted, that that worked. And so that's the idea of these, um, of these blocking, blocking service that we created here, all right? So this one, so now we know this blocking service. Very good. So let me show you something. All right, so here's by the way, the uh, 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 URL to World Clone. I don't know if I mentioned that. Maybe I mentioned that before. So what just happened here? Here's some pseudo code. It's not really actual code, but you have the browser in the browser, maybe with JavaScript. Well, gotta be JavaScript. You're uh, requesting a service in the back backend service, and then you call the database, but when you call the database right here, you have to wait for the database to get all the, for example, 100 words in order to return that. So kind of things are blocking. So you have to wait here. So this thread that the server creates, the web server creates, it's blocked, right? You cannot do anything else on that thread. What is the solution? To use something like RTDBC which is non-blocking. So now everything is non-blocking. So when you call the database, it calls the database, but it continues. So you can do something else with that thread, right? Um, this is kind of the idea behind R2DBC, to bring R2DBC, uh, sorry, reactive programming to these, this part of the architecture. All right, so let's talk a little bit about reactive programming. So there's a reactive manifesto, which is kind of, uh, um, you know, a, a document that describes Reactive systems. Now you can do reactive programming and not be and, and not uh, be part of a reactive system, but that's a different story. Uh, so I recommend reading that one. There's the Reactive Foundation, which is kind of a catalyst of all things reactive. Uh, it's part of the Linux Foundation, I believe. And uh, well, there are a whole lot of uh, projects, interesting projects um, there that, that you should uh, check. This is not Java only. This is uh, bigger than than Java, right? There's the Reactive X. Um, project, which is an API for asynchronous programming with observable streams, it says there. Basically, an API to do reactive programming. And now you can see that there is a choose your platform button right there. That's because it's actually uh, many libraries. So this is the API, but there are implementations of this API in several languages. So like C++, Python, JavaScript. Obviously, there is one for Java. Uh, and that one, it's called Rx Java, so reactive extensions for the JVM. Uh, but that's not what we're going to use. We're going to use another one, which is called Project Reactor, which is another library to do um, reactive programming. And there's uh, there another one, at least, um, as far as I know. Uh, and this is based on something called the Reactive Streams, which is a very tiny library uh, that has... Um, for for interfaces, and so th those were actually moved uh, uh, in the uh, JDK nine to this class, or not moved, but they were copy they, they copied and pasted 
in the, inside this class, basically. So it's the same for 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 um, Java interfaces. So, but the the main ones are this publisher and subscriber. And so the idea is that a publisher just creates it's a, like it's like a, a a series of data or events or something, right? For example, it could be clicks on a user interface, or it could be a route in a database or anything. And you can subscribe to that publisher, and as items or objects of type, in this case, T, are become available, then you, you can act on that, on this method, right? So here's a, a very a simple example with Project Reactor. So first we create a publisher of users, and we have a service that returns that kind of publisher, and it's get users, right? Kind of familiar, I bet you have seen this um, before. Uh, maybe you are using already uh, React program, but if you are not, then it's like, uh, very common pattern, right? You call service, you get a list, for example, of users, just that in this, ca in this case, we're not getting a list, but a publisher. Then with th this is reactive streams. Now, Project Reactor, you can convert that publisher to a Flux, which has more methods here, more reactive operations, which is all these operations is, is something that makes uh, that make uh, reactive programming so powerful. And there are many, we are not gonna cover that at all here, but um, there are many. Mm. So we're converting that. One of those operations, for example, is the subscribe method here, uh, which make it, makes it simpler to, uh, to use uh, every instance of this that's coming from that publisher. Then we can do something with that user when it becomes available, right? So the key here is that this is, you call these, but the thread continues executing the next line, the next line and so forth. So we can do more stuff here immediately after calling this while the service may be scoring a REST service or a database or any IO operation that could take some time. I can do something more with this thread instead of just waiting here and keeping that thread there, you know, idle. Uh, this, this, this is super quick because this doesn't really uh, execute the do something with user whatever you put here. Uh, this is just a configuration for that flux. Um, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be called when in the future, when, when a user becomes av available. So there's also R2GBC, which, is, which, which takes the reactive programming paradigm to the uh, world of re the um, relational databases, right? Uh, most um, or the major or database vendors implement R2DBC drivers. Here we're going to use the MariaDB R2DBC driver, which was one of the more mature driver, drivers, R2DBC drivers, that is. And here is the API for R2DBC. So a bunch of, of um, interfaces. Uh, these are some of them. And the main ones are actually so a connection factory. You create a connection, obviously. From a connection, you can create a statement that's a SQL statement or SQL statement. Uh, you run it or execute it and you get a result and from your result, and result you have rows, right? Kind of similar, a bit like uh, GDBC. So here is the contents of this, uh, some of these uh, interfaces. So the connection factory that creates connections. Um, it, it uses reactive streams, which is what I'm showing here. And there is this, this create method, it doesn't create the connection. It doesn't return the connection, sorry but it returns a publisher of connections. So when you call this, you can do more stuff again. And in, at some point in the future, you'll get the connection, right? If you subscribe to that publisher. The uh, connection interface, well, you find a begin transaction, close uh, commit transaction, mm, a whole lot of methods there. And they, you'll see the same pattern. It returns when it's an, an operation that needs to talk to database, then it returns a publisher instead of the actual value or just you know returning immediately it lets you know when the transaction has begun for example here now there is a create statement so this that returns that statement without the publisher because it's just a data structure it doesn't need to go to database to create this object and here it is the the, the uh, statement interface as you can see when you execute that of course you get again a publisher of results not the result but a publisher of the results. So you need to um, uh, subscribe to that and then you'll get the results there. 
and there are all kinds of methods to bind uh, parameters um, inside the, the query. Here's the result uh, interface. So you get um, to map rows to any type of T in the domain model, like users or orders or, or, or any kind of stuff, right? And the row, you can get the values by index or the name uh, in, the, in the query, in the, like in the column, right? There are some other methods there, uh, but this is the idea. So here's an example on, of how to use it. Uh, I'm omitting the connection part for simplicity. Just I'm just gonna show you the uh, select statement. So you create this statement, then you create a publisher because you need, or, or, or you execute the statement and you get a publisher of results, right? Then this continues the execution while the database is working. And meanwhile, we are configuring a flux again to gain access to all these uh, more methods. Remember that the publisher interface had just one method. Now we have more because we have a flux. For example, one of those operations is flat map. That's required because the uh, map method returns a publisher. So you get a publisher of publishers. So uh, it's easier this way. Uh, the important thing is that we are mapping this row that, that we are getting here to a new task, which is now in the domain model. And we get uh, the, the values, we pass it to this constructor, um, and then we subscribe and we get tasks. And as, as tasks are made available by the database, then you can do something with those tasks. This is the basic idea. Now, these have been involved, so fortunately there are RTDBC clients. So one of them is uh, Spring Data RTDBC. I think Juke, J-O-O-Q, also supports this pretty well. And uh, maybe I'm missing another couple of clients that I don't remember right now. Um, we're going to use this one here, Spring Data RTDBC. Uh, so let's do that. Let's actually jump into the uh, Visual Studio Code IDE. And let me show you the pom.xml for this service. So let's go over here, reactive service. We're using Spring Data R2DBC. We are not using JDBC anymore here. So yeah, we don't have all the advantages maybe of JDBC, but we also don't have the disadvantages. <laughs> so it depends, it depends on, on their requirements, right? Just keep in mind that this is not JDBC, not we are using R2DBC data. Spring security for the same reason. So I'm going to deactivate that. And we're using web flux here, which is uh, uh, mm, kind of uh, based on, on Netty here. So Netty is just a, an asynchronous event-driven network uh, application framework, right? We're using this. This kind of replaces replaces servlet, so that everything is non-blocking. Then we have the dev tools, and since we have our two DBC uh, Spring of data R2DBC, we need an R2DBC driver. I'm using the MariaDB R2DBC driver instead of the JDBC driver, right? Um, project Lombok, uh, um, there's uh, some other things for testing, but we are not interested in those right now. This is again, as generated by the Spring Initializer. And now let's go here to the application, the properties, and this one is empty this time or almost empty, I configure pre-configured the ports in 1990. So we can run both. Um, again, I'm excluding Spring Security in this case, the name of the class is different because it's reactive. So let's let's complete that, that configuration. It's so similar to this that I'm gonna do some copy paste driven development. I shouldn't have closed that file. There we go. So a cool thing is that some of these properties are exactly the same. So I can just go ahead and say R2 DBC. And this is fine. And obviously it's not JDBC, it's R2 DBC, right? Same, almost, almost the same URL. Username, password, same. Now here, let's see, this is maximum full size. I was using Hikari, but now we cannot use that because that, that's for JDBC. Mm, so we cannot use that, but maximum full size. That is um, max size here. There we go. This is how we get exactly the same configuration. Uh, let me actually do this. Uh, connection timeout, I think, would be max acquired time. 
And for that, we're going to use the same 10 seconds, right? There we go. So we have the same configuration. Uh, what is, do we need to do here? Let me show you the code now, the, the Java code. Nothing really different, right? But again, once again, it's so similar that I'm going to just go ahead and, and copy these three guys from here and paste into this package. Now we need to fix some stuff here. So let me go ahead and remove these imports because we are not using JDBC. We don't even have it uh, on the class path. Um, and we don't need the entity um, annotation. We need an ID annotation though. So that's required, but it comes from a different package as you can see there. It's not JPA anymore. And transient is something from JDBC. Uh, sorry, from JPA, so we didn't need it. It's going to map only what we tell it to map in the SQL query. So that one is ready. Now, as per the repository, we can just remove that. Uh, we need to import the repository from a different package. Now, there's also R2DBC. I can show you R2DBC repository, that one there, that it's uh, the first option here, uh, if you want all the default methods. And then we have the query it comes from another package as well. So data R to DBC. And uh, there's no such thing as non-native queries because again, we are not using JPA. So we don't have uh, JPA um, query language queries. Now, the cool thing is that because this is reactive now, we can perfectly return a list here, but that, that, that won't do any, any good for us, right? It's, it's just not using JPA, that's it. Uh, the advantage is that we can return a flux here. And now we are not blocking because when you create a list, it needs to create all the list first before it can return that list. Now this is going to return a publisher, Right, it's flux, but it's it's a publisher, mm, so you you can do more stuff with that thread, as I have mentioned many times already. Now let's go to service. The service. Uh, we don't need to transform this into a uh, stream, so we don't need to convert back to uh, a list. Uh, but what we can do now is just return a flux. What happened there? Okay. Flux, right? And since we are returning a flux, something we gain here is that we can produce, I believe that I would need the value parameter here explicitly, um, produces a new media type. That media type is event stream value. So this, uh, this is something called, um, I think it's server server sent events, and there's a JavaScript um, JavaScript API for that called uh, I, I believe it's event source in JavaScript. So you can use the event source JavaScript uh, API to kind of get in kind of similar way uh, all the words in this case as they arrive as as they be become available from the service. Uh, so that's pretty cool. We're going to see it because uh, browsers implement that by default when we query this. So you're going to see that I believe that this is ready. So everything is the same, right? Kind of the same. Now we can try to run that project here, reactive service. Let's see if we get any errors. Hopefully not. It seems like it worked. Let me clear this. And um, oh yeah, we need to go to the, to the browser. So I'm going to change 8080. I'm going to replace that with 9090. And let's request one word. So this should be uh, much more different. It, the structure is a bit different. So it, it's enclosing this data um, field here, right? But if we request this again, we should get a different word and so forth, right? 
Now, let's do this experiment. So I'm going to request 100 words. And again, I want you to look over here, this part of the screen, because I'm going to do the same. I'm going to go to the end of the screen by pressing end on my keyboard uh, after I um, request the service. And you're going to see that words appear. So you start to appear. They, they come like in, in a bunch of words, right? But you are going to see, you're going to see at the end that we get a, a batch of them, then another one. And well, let's see, let's see an action. So here we go. Look over here. Okay, so it's taking some time. There we go. End of the page. Did you see that here? So that's that's the um, event stream API. But the 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 thing here is that we saw something, at least part of the data, sooner than with the, the uh, blocking service. So that's kind of one of the difference. So, um, so that is the reactive service that I wanted to, to show you in this uh, demo. Now let's talk about JDBC versus RGDBC. How do they um, compare? What, is the, what can we say about this, right? Now, if you go online, you'll, you'll find uh, opinions and, and also experiments that people have been running. For example, Brian Getz says that I think Project Loom is going to kill React programming. Uh, well, we, we have to see that, uh, a bit of controversy here, but I think uh, one important part in React programming is the, all the operators. And let's remember all these projects that, that are, uh, you know, pretty active and the foundation, all these things. So uh, we have to see that. I have uh, found also conversations on how to actually make the reactive programming libraries use Lombok in, instead of, you know, just removing. Uh, the key here for me is the, the uh, reactive programming operators. Sometimes they make a piece of code much shorter. Uh, it comes with its own challenges as well, obviously. Uh, but, well, we'll see how the adoption goes. Uh, Gaetano, Gaetano Piazzola said that, um, or made this um, uh, experiment where he created a real world uh, kind of architecture. It's pretty interesting because there are many pieces there that yeah, resemble a real world application. And he found that R2DBC is better in a peculiar and very specific case. So not all cases, in fact, just one case for him. Um, now this is one, one kind of uh, real world application, there could be many. And you find the opposite. So Martin Smith, Smith uh, he also created this uh, test where he iterates uh, uh, on these tests many times. It's a lot of data and he analyzes this. And he found something a bit different, but also interesting. So let me read that for you. For best response times and throughput in Spring Boot, use WebFlux plus R2DBC, which is what we did with the reactive service. Um, for best response times and throughput in Quarkus, use blocking a blocking stack with JDBC. So different results, right? No silver bullet. Not, not a surprise, really. Mm. But it's interesting to see um, that even the stack could influence whether RTDBC is a better option or not. So. Should I go reactive? Should, should I refactor now my application or should I <laughs> should I create the next service in a reactive way? Uh, well, it depends, right? That's not the right answer always. Um, so in order to kind of answer that question, I like to use this analogy to explain reactive programming. So let's say you have an appointment with someone, somebody somewhere in some building, office, whatever. And this person has a secretary. So they are not there yet for you, but they have a secretary and they tell you, please wait, take a seat. That's the traditional approach, right? The reactive approach is if the, is if the um, secretary told you, I'll call you back. Then you can say, okay, I'll go do something else. And that's the difference. Go do something else is the difference. So you're not waiting because at the end of service time, it's the same for both approaches, right? When you meet this person, it's gonna be at the same time. So it's not that you get the resource faster. It's just that 
maybe you did something else or not. So keeping this analogy in time, we are going to measure primarily here throughput with this tool called artillery. You can install it with NPM like that. Um, so let's go to your Visual Studio Code. And let me show you so how this works. I'm not going to explain this, uh, this artillery tool uh, entirely. Um, but the idea is that you create a YAML file. And so each project has its own YAML file. <clears throat> and I, put it, I, I placed it in the, mm, in the same uh, well, di directory where the project is, but you can, you can place it somewhere else or in the test um, resources or really anywhere. Uh, uh, for this, I place it here because it's gonna be much easier um, for this demo. The important thing is that we have both. So this is for blocking. There we go. I'm gonna explain real quick this. And there is one for reactive. So they are both the same. So this is reactive because it's 1990. The other one is 80, 80, 90, 90. But as you can see, the content other than the port is the same. So the same test. Okay, so here we go. So we have a configuration. This configuration is going to target this URL. This is the um, blocking service, 8080. And so we have one phase here, which is going to, uh, during 10 seconds, is going to request something or the service at this rate, 10 per second, like 10 users per second during 10 seconds, okay? And uh, we're going to set a timeout of 30 seconds, which is pretty high to say like, yeah, this didn't work. Now, you can, we can build several scenarios. So we only have one, which is, well, request actually two words. Uh, and so we are getting, we're calling with the get method, this, this uh, URL from here, right? Slash words, limit 50. So I'm requesting 50 words, which we, we saw it takes time. At least 100 took seconds. So 50 is gonna take seconds as well. So that's what we are going, going to test here. So let me see how, how to do this thing. Um, should I go into a, let's just use a terminal, maybe create two here. All right, uh, let me maximize this. So CD uh, blocking service. There we go, we're in the blocking service. Now all we have to do is artillery run and the name of the YAML file. You can you can call these whatever you want to uh, to call. It doesn't matter because you specified there. So I'm going to hit enter and it's going to start requesting the blocking service. So it's working. It's probably sending those requests ten per second. I think it was. Uh, and you can take a little bit of time and see what happens. And, and these are some partial results. Now let's wait until the, the final results. This is still, still working there. Let's see. There we go. The summary reports here. So remember, remember the analogy. So I'm mostly interested in this thing here. Yeah, you can you can and should have a look at the other things. Uh, leave that uh, leave that as a uh, uh, homework for here. But I'm interested in this one. So HTTP 200, which is OK, right? The OK answer, 31. OK, so let's try to remember that number, 31 for the blocking service. Now let's go here and see the into the reactive service and run the same artillery, run this test file. There we go. So now it's the reactive uh, service working to you now produce all the uh, responses to the to the requests in a reactive way this time. Some partial metrics right now. I actually didn't uh, pay attention to the numbers in the previous one, so I don't know if this is doing better or not. Let's see, <laughs> sometimes 
uh, I don't remember. I think for these numbers, RTDBC is going to to win, obviously, because I wanted to show that. But if you change them, we can try that if there is time. It might be the other way around. That JDBC wins, so it's it, it, it's a better option. Uh, but let's see. Let's just wait. Oh, there we go. Here it is. So HTTP two hundred sixty five versus thirty one. I think it was. Yeah, blocking service thirty one to uh, HTTP two hundred. Reactive, 65. So there's quite a difference there, right? So for this scenario, if in this kind of microservice, it totally makes sense to go reactive, right? Now, I think we we have a little bit of time. So let me, yeah, just let's do some more experiments. So what if I just request one word, for example, one word. Let's say that that's a use case. You never get to request a whole lot of words. Uh, what What's going to happen then? So let's try that. Uh, let me clear that this is the blocking service. There we go. So let's try this again. I think this this one I have I haven't tried, so it's going to be uh, interesting for me to find out because I have tried different um, different kind of uh, rates. So more requests, less requests. But the words I always use kind of a high number, but let's try something like that. Uh, 245 for blocking. Now let's go ahead with reactive. 45 was blocking. So for reactive, let's see. Let's see. I read the note. Maybe it's um, pretty similar. Maybe it's a bit faster. Maybe it's slower. Maybe uh, it has. Maybe it's just lower, but it serves more users. That's something I should have checked in the first iteration of this experiment. But now you can do that. This all, this all on GitHub. I'm going to share a, a link to the GitHub uh, soon. Uh, you just have to run this. And you can create with Docker. You can create the MariaDB uh, database. And, and there are some instructions on how to create that database, how to load some data. OK, so 200 was 60. Six, I forgot this one. 45, 60, 66. So it's still, still faster, right? Still faster. Uh, I invite you to try this. I invite you to not only modify those, but see different. Uh, one has a good day. I'll speak to you soon. Different uh, kind of you know services here. Maybe you don't need this. Uh, so the code is available on GitHub. The, uh, the, uh, github.com slash MariaDB developers find the uh, reactive repository. I don't remember the exact name. I think it's just like this, reactive programming exam Java examples. You'll find it there. I invite you to also try Sky SQL. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting things there. Um, and uh, you can contact me uh, via email, uh, Twitter. I just tweet about software development really and uh or mostly at least and on github alejandro doer you can also find this example so i guess that's what i had uh today i hope you like it and if there are questions let's uh let's try to 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 answer mm -hmm.